Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Woodlad Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Regan Todd at Todd's Racing. So go give the lad a follow on his Facebook page for all the latest news and including probably a sneak peek at the Waterlad horse. And also, O Studio, as you'll hear in this episode, the importance of spending time on your well-being is massive. So here's a fitting message from the lad, Timmy Bateman. Hi guys, Tim Bateman here from O Studio. If you're looking for a unique experience to gift at Christmas, check out our gift vouchers at ostudio.co.nz. We've got some awesome packages available that would be the perfect gift for a loved one. If you're looking for a career change in 2023, you're passionate about health and wellness, you're a top lad, and you have some money to invest in a business, enter your details at ostudio.co.nz forward slash lad, and I'll give you a shout. Back to Jimmy. Ah, what a lad. Well, for today's episode, we have something a bit different to the normal. We don't have our usual rugby career to go through, but today's guest has just so much knowledge that I just want to share with you all. How you breathe can have such a massive effect on your life, whether you're a pro sportsman or not. I've personally done a few sessions with him now, and I just want you guys to hear how breathing properly could potentially change your life. I love picking the brains of a guru, and there is none better than the lad himself, Jamie O'Donnell. Welcome, mate. Settle down, mate. Great to be here, mate. Can't wait to dive in and have a chat. Mate, like I said, I've done a few sessions with you before and um, loved what I got out of them and I sort of just want to share that knowledge with all my listeners because I know so many people are in, into rugby or whether it's social sports or professional sports or even just everyday life. I know how much of effect breathing can have on them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, mate, we've had a few breakfasts and obviously you've come up home a couple of times and we've been through a fair bit, so um, there's so much to cover off Uh I think the funny thing with breathing is that it's something that we do and have done since we're born and you do it unconsciously, never give any thought to it. But, you know, you can go a couple of, you know, 30 days without food or whatever it is, a few days without water and, you know, three minutes without oxygen or whatever. So can you hold your breath for three minutes? That's decent. I'm thinking like 30 seconds, 25 seconds tops. Yeah, I might have exaggerated. (laughs) (laughs) We can do it at the end. We'll see who's got the longest breath hold. Mate, you will win that for sure. But I've come away from a few of your sessions and you know I've tried to explain it to other people and then I've got to the point where I've tried to explain it and I just can't really articulate what it is or how, how to actually do it. So um, that's why I'm really keen to sit down with you and sort of have a have something I can go back and listen to and um, you know have the full effect of it and be able to really let it sink in. Yeah, cool. I mean, I think a good place to start is probably there's different elements to it. So there's obviously sports performance and breathing within sport. Um, and there's the stress response cycle, which is understanding um, how to perform under pressure and how to manipulate and control your breath so that you can control your physiology and your psychology in real time. Um, very useful in a sporting environment, but also in any pressure situation, um, whether you own a business, whether it's corporate, whether it's just family life or whatever. I think that stuff's really important, but probably the foundation is actually coming back to um, looking at your day-to-day breathing patterns as well. So, uh, you know, a huge percentage of the population, I think it's about 65% of the population have got dysfunctional breathing patterns. Um, I was definitely one of those people, (laughs) Um, slowly working my way out of it. But, um, you know, from a kid, I think I had asthma and, um, you know, probably over-breathed and mouth-breathed my entire life and wasn't until uh, a few years ago when I started to dive into the breathwork side of things through some health issues actually, that I started to realize how ineffective my breathing was and then the flow on effect to that um, in terms of my overall health and well-being, uh, but also particularly around mental health. And then, uh, as you know, I've always been really interested in the mental side of sport and uh, mental performance uh, and have sort of spent, I don't know, probably a decade, um, you know, learning in that space. And there'd always sort of been a missing component to it. And it wasn't until I tapped into the breathwork side of things and realized and really understood that trying to control your psychology without control of your physiology uh, is an incredibly hard or near on impossible thing to do so um yeah it all came for me it all came back to actually just learning about day-to-day breathing and i think assessing you know there's some really low-hanging fruit so just for anyone listening bear with me for the next few minutes we'll get to some exciting stuff but you do have to lay a foundation for it uh the reality is like how you breathe day to day um if you're an athlete or um, you know, a high performance person, how you breathe, uh, unconsciously day to day does, isn't just going to change when you step into a high performance arena. So the lowest hanging fruit is to start looking at your day to day general function of your breathing. And I think for the most part, a lot of us, um, 
breathe through our mouth. And uh, when you think about it, your nose is here for a reason. You've got two nostrils. Um, you know, there's a whole function in your nose which uh, moistens the air and gets everything ready so that, you know, you can absorb the air properly. Um, and obviously the size of your nasal passages are incredibly small compared to the size of your mouth. So the amount of air flow that you can get through your nose compared to your mouth differ massively. Um, you know, a lot of people are walking around unconsciously breathing into their upper chest and breathing through their mouth and probably over breathing. Um, it's a thing called chronic hyperventilation syndrome, which is just essentially over the course of a 24 hour period where you've got poor breathing mechanics. Um, and you're probably breathing too fast and breathing too shallow, breathing into your upper chest and taking in too much air. Uh, and so the flow on effect of that, um, is that essentially without getting too technical, but when you, um, breathe too much oxygen the the flow on effect of that is that essentially you get a you know a reduction in co2 in your lungs and in your blood um which is increases your blood ph which then um causes an arousal of the central nervous system and the flow on effect of that is you get blood flow constriction um you get reduced blood flow to the brain uh and to the heart you your red blood cells and hemoglobin actually hold on to oxygen instead of delivering them to your working muscles tissues and cells so by over breathing we actually get less oxygen delivery to the working muscles, tissues, and cells. So if you think about that in a, in a sports arena, uh, that could mean lower athletic performance potentially. But in a day-to-day life, um, if we're highly stressed, we're in a sympathetic sort of stress fight-or-flight state a lot. Uh, if we're breathing too much through our upper chest uh, and through our mouth, um, you know that's where over a long period of time that can lead to uh, you know chronic illness and things like that as well. So... Yeah, it's not just about sports performance. There's definitely a huge underlying health element to it. Um, but I think the the low hanging fruit is essentially paying attention to how you breathe throughout the day, and it's something we're unconscious of. So if you just drop in and start paying attention to the way that you're breathing um, a few times throughout the day, and just try and pick up whether you're breathing in through your mouth or whether you're breathing through your nose, uh, and then uh, you know a big one is whether you sleep with your mouth open and breathe through your mouth, or whether you're nasal breathing at night, and uh, a telltale sign that you're a mouth breather. Um, would be if you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning yeah. uh, or if you wake up and you feel like you haven't had sleep, like if you haven't rest, rested and recovered, um, then that could be pointing towards some dysfunctional breathing patterns and probably uh, an overuse of the mouth and underuse of the nostrils. Mm. So how do, you, how do you go about changing from a mouth breather to a nasal breather? Because even though I'm now aware that you're supposed to be breathing through the through the nasals, I, I've been waking up with a dry mouth now and again, and I <laughs> panic, shut my mouth and, you know, try and get get it back through the nose but um how do you make that big shift uh the lowest hanging fruit is simply to tape your mouth at night and i know it sounds pretty wacky and out the gates but um yeah yeah, like i'm someone who's breathed through my mouth for the majority of my life uh particularly at night and woken up dry mouth in the morning uh often woken up after an eight or ten hour sleep and felt like i hadn't slept at all you know wake up foggy in the morning um and so probably a year and a half two years ago i started simply just taping my mouth shut, really? um, read, a, read a book, Breathe, um, which went into some of it and decided to give it a try and noticed a pretty instant change um, in terms of how I felt in the morning. Uh, it's like, I'm not going to say it's an instant change because it's pretty unnatural if you've breathed through your mouth through your whole life to then just switch. Mm. So um, don't go and tape your whole mouth shut. You can just get a little strip of medical tape and put it over your mouth here um, so that you can still, you know, take air in through your mouth if you needed to. Yeah. Um, But it just helps close the lips at night and helps to retrain your body um, to start naturally breathing in through the nostrils um, and out through the mouth. Um, A lot of people will say that they don't breathe through their nose because they have congestion in the airways. Mm -hmm. But you'll notice that the more that you start to breathe through your nose, unless you've got like an obstruction, Mm -hmm. but most people um, who experience congestion in the airways, it's actually because they're not using the nose enough. So um, when that's not used, it gets inflamed causes constriction um and so once you actually start breathing through the nose you'll find it easier and easier True. but the bottom line is you've got to start and i think the first thing is just paying attention to it mm. understanding it um and starting to shift towards uh an awareness throughout the day whether it's just setting little timers a couple of timers throughout the day just to check in on your breath and you know that awareness is the first step um and then the second thing would be to you know if you do find yourself waking up with a dry mouth or you find yourself um you know, you know that you are a mouth breather, then uh, to take the mouth at night and give it a crack and, um, you know, see how you feel after a few weeks. Mate, that's me tonight. So do you never have anything in your, like anything obstructing your nose? I always feel like I have something like 
in or floating around my yeah. nose. I don't know what it is, but there's always something in there that's sort of obstructing my breathing at least a little bit. Totally, yeah. I think most of my life I genuinely believed that I had to have surgery on my nose. Uh, like I thought, I, you know, the, when we can get the sinuses bored out, um, yeah. I genuinely thought that I needed to get that surgery done. And I'd actually been to a nose, uh, ear and throat specialist and, um, yeah, since retraining my breathing patterns, um, like, don't get me wrong, I'll still have times where um, there's a bit of congestion and things there, but for the most part, my airways, the capacity and the ability to have clear, uh, unobstructed breathing is completely different to what it was a couple of years ago, and that's just from actually training myself to use mm. the nose. Right, it's so interesting. And you mentioned, like, what are, what are the other benefits you've found from breathing through your nose? Yeah, the biggest one for me, changing your breathing rate. So when, obviously when you change your, when you start breathing from your mouth, where you've probably quite a, got a, quite a fast breathing rate, breathing into your upper chest. Um, whereas when you start breathing through your nose and start training yourself to breathe properly, you can slow your breathing rate down. Um, and slowing your breathing rate down has obviously well, it has a huge impact um, on whether you're pushing towards a sympathetic stress state or whether you're in a more relaxed, calm, uh, rest and digest state, um, parasympathetic state. And I think looking back on it now, uh, having chronically mouth breathed um, as a youngster, and then you know playing sport and everything else sleeping with my mouth open um and then the day-to-day -day stress of life and running a business and um you know the busy lifestyles that we all live um pressures of general life probably found that over the years i was you know really stuck in like a stress state more often than i needed to be mm. and so i think probably the biggest thing for me is through re-educating myself on how to breathe properly um and changing my breathing patterns back to nasal breathing is the biggest thing for me has been mental mm. um you know, being able to control any kind of underlying anxiety uh, and just having better control of my mental state, feeling calmer and spending more time um, balance, either, you know, balancing that nervous system better or being uh, able to push towards a parasympathetic rest and digest state as opposed to just constantly being stuck in a stress state. Mm. And what pushed you um, to get sort of into breathing or look into it a little bit deeper? Like you mentioned the health scare. Was, was that what really uh, made you want to go deeper into the space? Yeah, it was. I a couple of years ago like I was having some gut issues yeah. and I've always been like super healthy person never really had any um you know any illnesses or anything like that I've never had to deal with any medical stuff um but started to just have gut issues uh had some skin flare-ups and ended up with like a skin infection um and essentially to cut a long story short I got some tests done privately through a nutritionist in Auckland Katie Boyd and um, there were some things out of whack with the gut, but uh, the biggest one was there was a positive cancer marker for stomach tumors or colon um, cancer. And yeah, so quite out of the out of the gates. And I got that test result the day before we went into lockdown. Uh -huh. um, and so, yeah, so literally got the test back, and it said the I think the acceptable marker was like a three point five or a four, and I was at a ten point one or a ten point three. Um, and Katie said to me, yeah, you need to go and get a colonoscopy and like check and like immediately. And then we went into lockdown and you couldn't access health or medical help for three or four months. I can't even remember how long the first one was, but it was a while. All uh, right. Stress levels through the roof. Yeah. And so I sort of like, oh shit, what do I, you know, what am I going to do? Um, and just figured that I could spend three, you know, however many months we we're going to be in lockdown worrying about it and making the whole situation worse. Knew there was a correlation between disease and stress. Um, and so mm -hmm. decided that one thing that I could do would, was just take control of my stress levels throughout that time, make sure that I was managing my stress because um, I didn't want to exacerbate anything that was there potentially. Uh, and so I started doing research, got into cold plunging. and um, I'd already been doing a bit of that stuff previously, but really started to look into it um, and really tapped into the breathwork side of things through that. And um, it's funny because looking back, knowing what I know now, um, being in that stress state, you, you know, constantly – uh, and the inefficiency of my breathing probably led over years to less blood flow to the digestive system over time. So not saying that that was the reason, but it would have been a contributing factor probably. Um, and then, you know, uh, the flow on effect of trying to push through and build businesses and constantly on the go um, and never never learning to downregulate um, and go into that rest and digest state properly. So that was the reason that I got into it and really started taking it seriously. And then the more I started to study it, the more I started to see the applications towards sport and towards general health, general life. Um, 
went and did some courses with some great people like Dave Wood, who's up in Auckland. Um, Woody's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and obviously he works with some pretty high level people. He was a, um, yeah, a paramedic for 13 years. So he's got a background in this stuff. He'd actually had some gut stuff as well. So I started talking to him about that and he said, mate, I've been there, I know all about it. Um, just tap in and just keep going down the route you're going with the breath work. Um, and, um, yeah, it was through doing his stuff and keeping in touch with him, um, that really pushed me to start doing some actual like uh, training and get a certification and, um, you know, start working in the space. So that, that was, that was the catalyst for it. It was definitely health. Um, turned out that everything was fine. I did have some cancerous polyps, but they were removed, um, uh, before it was a problem. So, um, yeah, it's funny cause you look back on it and sometimes the worst things that happen to you turn out to be the best things. And I've thought about this quite a lot recently where had I've never had those health scares and things, um, I would never have been introduced to the world, which I'm really passionate about now. So it's funny how that, mm. that sort of happens. So. It is a, eh? like everything, like they say, everything happens for a reason. And that's, that's another really cool example of it. Eh? Yeah. Like, we health scare pushes you down this route and look at you now. You're, you're a breathing guru. <laughs> it also just made, like, I think the health thing made me think about controlling stress mentally so i'd always tried to uh i always thought that i i genuinely didn't think i had any stress i think that was the thing i thought that i was bulletproof um had always been really interested in mindset and positive psychology and things and so i'd always built a really good perspective or what i thought was a really good perspective uh and had always managed to kind of thrive under adverse situations and almost liked pressure and you know all of that so I kind of loaded my plate as much as I could. And I thought that that was how I got the best out of myself. Um, Mm. And I genuinely didn't think that I had much stress because mentally I was fine, but the stress was manifesting itself physically uh, in my body. And Mm. um, yeah, I guess that was a wake up call for me where I'm like, it's not just about the mental. It's also like there's the physical, there's this physiology and the psychology um, and the crossover, which is called um, psychophysiology. But um, those two things can't sort of coexist without each other. And, um, I guess it was learning that through my health. Um, but then also looking at it from a sports performance perspective and going, Oh, hang on a minute. How does this apply to things like, you know, sports psychology is massive, but it's all about, um, the mindset and it's all about, um, uh, you know, creating a high performance psychology, but how much are we teaching about controlling physiology and down-regulating your physiology um, so that you can have a clear, calm mind under pressure. And so, um, yeah, it was through the health that I started to put those pieces of the puzzle together and then uh, it all became pretty obvious. And there's some other people out there who are doing great work, like Nigel Beach, who's another guy in New Zealand who's doing some great stuff. Um, Listened to a few of his talks and things and, um, you know, he was talking about that crossover and, um, you know, particularly within sport, the ability to control your psychology um, you know, being largely reliant on your biz- ability to control your physiology. So a few few good people started talking about it and then started listening and, and studying it more. And, um, yeah, as you know, we've had some pretty good conversations about it. So. Mm, nah, it's so cool. So what's everyday sort of breathing look like for you? What's your, what's your breathing routine? Obviously, you take your mouth at night and wake up feeling fresh, but then, then what's the rest of the day look like? Uh, I just, I've got a, like a 20, it's about a 21 minute breathing flow that I do every day. It's just cadence breathing. And the entire purpose of it is to put me into as much of a relaxed, um, parasympathetic state as possible. So, um, for anyone that's listening, you've got a sympathetic nervous system and you've got two branches of the sympathetic nervous system, the, um, sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system is your stressed fight or flight, um, or freeze state, um, typically referred to people probably be um, familiar with that term fight or flight state Uh, and then you've got your parasympathetic branch which is your rest and digest relax state Um, and so the breathing flow that I do um, has got three different cadences to it but it's all about slowing the breath down um, and achieving light slow deep breathing nasal breathing and yes stimulating the vagus nerve uh, and really putting yourself into a relaxed calm state so I do that every day. That's sort of been religious um, for quite a while now. Like up there with brushing my teeth, I just drop in and do it. Um, obviously, we've done it together. Yeah. You feel great at the end of it. Um, and the, there's multiple reasons to that to do that daily practice. But for me, number one is to um, balance the nervous system, make sure that I'm down-regulating and bringing myself back to that calm, relaxed, parasympathetic, rest and digest state. Because the reality is like life's stressful. There's shit that's going to come at us left, right and centre. If you want to go and build a business or coach a football team or do anything great, um, you're going to have to learn to endure greater levels of stress. So it's not about trying to get away from stress. I think sometimes when we talk about stress, it's framed up really badly as if it's a bad thing. 
But the reality is like, if you want to do anything great in life, you're going to have to be able to be resilient and you're going to have to be able to cope and deal with a large amount of stress. Um, and so it's not about pushing it away. It's about learning to embrace it and learning to function with it, but not allowing that chronic underlying stress to build up. Um, and so for me, the daily practice is about making sure that I bring myself back down every day and down regulate the system. And also, you know, throughout that 20 minutes, you're also training your breathing capacity as well. So you're strengthening your breathing muscles, you're using proper uh, technique, because I think that's one of the big things, like, um, especially when you're starting out, most people's or a lot of people's breathing mechanics are quite poor. We've always breathed into the upper chest and used the chest muscles to breathe, but we've never actually breathed into the diaphragm and used your proper uh, breathing muscles. So often when you make that transition towards that low, slow, deep breathing, it's quite hard to achieve. And that's purely because the breathing muscles are so weak. And so slowing your breath and softening your breath right down uh, can be quite challenging from a, a mechanical perspective. Um, and so that daily breathing flow is a good way to strengthen those muscles as well. Um, and then the stronger the muscles, uh, the more reps that you put into the bank, then the easier it is to breathe properly um, without thinking about it. So, um, yeah, I do my daily breathing flow. And then if I'm doing any exercise, uh, like if I'm doing any cardio work, try and nasal breathe as much as possible throughout the cardio. So if it's on the assault bike or going for a run or whatever it is, even if I just go for a walk, um, trying to be really conscious of breathing through my nose, not through my mouth, because my natural tendency is to rock back to the mouth and uh, particularly under stress, like on, you know, exercise. Yeah. Um, and like I've always been pretty into my combat sports and boxing and bits and pieces and had really poor breathing mechanic <laughs> really poor breathing in general uh when under stress and when exercising and so a big transition for me has been to bring back and really ingrain those good breathing patterns not just day to day um, but to bring them into an environment where you are stressed and under pressure as well mm. um and there's huge benefits to using nasal breathing when you're doing exercise as well um increase your co2 tolerance um which helps with your kind of athletic endurance and things as well um so there's a raft of benefits that come with nasal breathing during exercise but it's definitely one of the lowest hanging fruits in terms of um improving your breathing mechanics and your mind muscle connection for breath as well because a lot of the time when you're exercising uh there's a lot of air hunger um, and you feel like you need to take in a lot of oxygen so naturally you open your mouth and you're taking in these huge big ineffective breaths into your upper chest but you're not actually really you often just breathing into dead space uh, and not really breathing into your lungs. Um, and you're actually probably getting poor oxygen delivery to the working muscles and cells because you're, you're over breathing. Um, and yeah, and not breathing efficiently. So nasal breathing through exercises is a great one. Um, try and do that as often as I can whenever I'm doing any cardio stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that's it, mate. As far as breathing goes, it's, it's basically my 20 minute routine and then just any exercise, making sure I'm nasal breathing. Yeah. So, so what intensities can you train up to? And still breathe through your nasal. I always found like as soon as it got a little bit hard, I'm straight into the mouth trying to get as much oxygen <laughs> as I can ineffectively. But if I try and stay in my nasals, I feel like I'm, I'm running out of air. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, for a start, as soon as you, as you switch to nasal breathing, you're taking in less oxygen, right? So um, you're going to have a buildup of CO2. Um, so you've got, yeah, oxygen and CO2 um, are always balancing in your biochemistry when you're breathing. So... Um, when you switch to nasal breathing um, from mouth breathing, particularly during exercise, uh, you'll be taking in less oxygen or you'll be taking in less air, obviously, um, and you have CO2 build up, particularly if the muscles are working and producing CO2. Um, and if you're breathing through your nose and not breathing through your mouth, like when you breathe out through your mouth, you dump CO2 out. So you lower that CO2 level. Um, so naturally, when you shift and, and switch over, um, well, until your body adapts, you probably have a higher level of oxygen hunger initially. And that's a bit of a mental battle where you've got to learn to control and understand that you don't necessarily actually need more oxygen. Um, it's just that CO2 is the trigger that tells your brain that you need to breathe. So if you've got CO2 building up in your system, it's telling your brain that you need to breathe. Um, but it's not actually that you're deprived of oxygen. It's just that you're getting that trigger to, to tell you to breathe. So there's a bit of a mental battle that goes on, which I think you have to fall in love with initially when you're trying to make that transition. But yeah. also, if you haven't breathed through your nose before, like if you're just transitioning straight away, you're not going to perfect it straight away. I think I used the analogy with you. You know, if you walk into the gym the first time and expect to pick up a 300 kilo weight um, on the deadlift, you're probably not going to be able to. You'll be shaky and you'll be ineffective. Um, and then, you know, the more repetitions and the, the more technique that you practice uh you know all of a sudden you start to build up your strength and over time you can reach those um that capacity and it's exactly the same with breathing like if you just switch into it today and you've never ever trained your breathing muscles you've never ever um 
you know, trained that capacity uh, and you've never been used to the feeling of oxygen hunger or, um, you know, using your nasal, nasal passage, you're not going to get it in day one. It's about mm. uh, understanding the benefits of it and then committing to a protocol and a training routine just like you do with anything else. Um, and starting to implement it into your day to day life, and then the more that you train it, the more repetitions that you get in the bank, the more you strengthen the breathing muscles and increase your breathing capacity, um, then the easier it all becomes. And obviously, there's a lot of guys who are about to embark on a pretty tough preseason. Give us a like a real life example of like a yo yo test where they 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 run for 20 meters, come back, uh, get that 10 second rest. What what does this sort of breathing look like in that? To, to help someone out to a PB. Should probably ask you, you're the yo-yo king, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's actually been some quite interesting studies. Like There was a study down in the UK um, it was actually used professional rugby players doing uh, a test, testing their repeat sprint ability. Yeah. So um, essentially that would be similar to a beep test, but it was done over 40 metre sprints. Um, and I think it was pre-season, but they took 21 professional national level rugby players in the UK yeah, split them into two groups, uh, and they did a four week training block where one group they increased their cardio sessions by two sessions per week, and the other group they, I think they reduced them by two, and then they added um, breath hold sprint work, um, and they tested the group at the beginning across the group, and the average repeat sprint ability over a forty meter sprint was nine point one, so the, the average of the group they could sprint forty meter sprints continuously. Uh, so 40 meter sprint back to the mark. I think it was a 20 second break. 40 meter sprint back to the mark. 40 meter sprint, and the average was 9.1. Um, and after four weeks, the group who did the extra cardio sessions went from 9.1 to 9.8, and the group that did the breath hold sprint training but reduced cardio training went from 9.1 to 14.9. Mm. Um, so I don't know. We're looking at like what a 40 odd percent increase in overall athletic performance yeah, um, so. within like a four week block. So. Yeah, I mean, it sounds too good to be true when you say it like that. Um, but yeah, that was one of the studies that they did. The way that you do that is you breathe in through your nose, out through your nose, pinch and hold your nose, and then they do the sprint on a breath hold at the bottom of the breath hold, so after the exhale. Yeah. Uh, and then what you're doing there is obviously you're not breathing, so your carbon dioxide levels are building up as you're sprinting, so you're going to get to a you know a pretty high level of ear hunger pretty quickly, um, which forces your body to adapt. So... Um, when your body starts to adapt and change its sensitivity to carbon dioxide, uh, it means that you can start to handle higher levels of carbon dioxide. It means you need to breathe less. So everything becomes more efficient. You also get an, uh, an increase in oxygen delivery to the working muscles and cells because um, when you've got um, increased carbon dioxide in the blood and in the lungs, um, it helps the hemoglobin or the hemoglobin ends up releasing um, more oxygen to the working muscles and cells. So, yeah. In in short, funnily enough, uh, you know, essentially breathing less actually creates more oxygen delivery to the working muscles, tissues, and cells. uh, And over breathing uh, can you know create less. So um, yeah, it's interesting going into preseason and things like that. There's lots of techniques um, that teams are using and um, individuals are using around breath hold work and um, you know the simulation of altitude training. that would be one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, um, you know, training yourself to have proper breathing mechanics so that you can um, use nasal breathing to soften, um, lighten, and slow down your breathing when you're under load. So, like, let's say you do have a uh, like a fast passage of play where you're running consistently, um, you're hitting rucks you know, maybe there's 20 phases or something like that. And by the time you get to the end of that, the whistle goes and you you might have 30 seconds or 20 seconds where you've got to get your head together and, and recover. Um, so, you know, it becomes incredibly important around the recovery aspect as well. And I know that that's talked about a lot within professional sport these days. Uh, it's the importance of recovery. But um, your ability to recover fast in real time essentially comes down to your ability to control your breath um, and downregulate your system in real time. So, you know, if you're training uh, yourself day to day to have better breathing efficiency, better breathing capacity, um, and and you're training your ability to handle uh, higher levels of CO2, um, then you know your ability to recover in real time is going to be a lot quicker than other guys as well, which means that you can get up and go again. Um, you know, after that next set piece, or whatever it is. So there's there's that from an athletic perspective, but there's also the mental side of that as well, because obviously. If you're breathing um, incredibly fast and hard and into your upper chest, you're 
uh, activating a stress response as well, which means that your body is going into an upregulation. And that's when it's very hard to control your mind and be calm under pressure as well, or calm in that moment. You can't really be calm and creative in your thinking when your body's in a stress state. Um, and so those guys who can re- recover quicker and downregulate um, by controlling their breath, uh, you know, will also have an increase um, in terms of their cognitive ability and their ability to control um, and have a calm mind when it matters most. So that's obviously a huge part of professional sport, uh, particularly when you reach the you know the top levels, because everyone's on a similar level when it comes to athletic ability and um you know skill sets pretty even across the board there's a few freaks out there but most people are pretty even mm. uh, and really what separates guys is their ability to perform when it matters and when the pressure's on and to consistently focus and perform under pressure and um you know a large part of that comes back to your ability to control your breath and down down regulate and control your physiology so that you can control your psychology mm. and that's massive in rugby eh? like instantly think about all the stoppages that there is um, like obviously when you when the ball's in play it's it's pretty intense like um, especially when you're hitting those rucks or um, getting through some physical contact but um, there was a lot of downtime especially in the backs where you've got these scrum resets and um, times to get set in the line out and things like that lots of opportunities to like you say get your breath working um, have this opportunity to recover and be ready for that next um, phase I think that's right I think rugby's like you know combat sport you've got no time yeah <laughs> you get a minute you get might fight a five minute round or a three minute round and then you've got a one minute break to recover um and but you're you're on for that five minutes and you don't really get much within that five minute passage where you're allowed to relax Mm -hmm. (laughs) um whereas rugby i think we worked out that there's it's roughly 30 minutes ball in play uh over an 80 minute game so essentially you've got 50 minutes of time where you can be regulating Mm -hmm. um down regulating your system calming your breathing and getting ready to make sure that you're, you're ready to rock and roll mentally and physically for that next play but the majority of that 50 minutes is um you know, not by everyone, but I'd say for the vast majority is pretty ineffectively used. Mm. Um, even when you're talking about plays or when it's coming to key moments in the game, like when your game's on the line and you're walking into the, the key lineouts and, um, you know, scrummages and maybe you've got a couple of minutes where you've got to try and get a try and, and get the game off the other team. Um, those conversations that you're having and those decisions that you're making require you to be calm and collected um, and present. And if you're... Uh, not recovered properly and your breathing is really inefficient and you're in a stressed uh, sympathetic state and then you're trying to make those decisions and communicate to your teammates and things you're going to be uh, less effective in those moments and obviously that's where games are won or lost uh, won or lost so um, you know I know Kerry Evans obviously um, you know is pretty famous for creating the red blue system which the All Blacks used and um, you know, that's the same thing. That's that parasympathetic, sympathetic and understanding where you're at. Um, and so, yeah, it's about using your breath to be able to control um, and downregulate in those times so that you're um, you're sharp and, and lucid and creative uh, and clear when you need to be. So what does that breathing look like for, for someone? Like there's, there's been a long phase, you're knackered. What does that breathing look like for that next 30, 40 seconds that you've got? For a start, you probably need to understand, just we'll just rewind a little bit, because you probably need to understand for anyone who's listening, like what that stress response cycle is and what's actually happening there. So essentially, like when, you, when you're under stress, whether that's physical stress, uh, like, you know, maybe you've just been hitting rucks and you're, you're in a really upregulated state, um, breathing into your upper chest and, and you're breathing fast and you're breathing hard. Um, or, you know, whether you get a fright, like, you know, if someone cuts you off at an intersection and you hit the brakes and like that initial response is like a, like you get a, a fright, whether you're hopping cold water and you get a fright yeah. or whether it's psychological as well. Like it can happen through thinking like you, it might be before a game where you're thinking and you start to get stressed at the thought of, um, you know, maybe performance anxiety or, um, whatever it is, but Whatever the stressor is, um, as soon as you create a stress response in the body, the body releases adrenaline and cortisol, which is the stress hormone. Um, and what adrenaline and cortisol does, or adrenaline, um, it creates an upregulation in your physiology. So your breathing rate starts to increase, your heart rate starts to increase, um, your bl- blood pressure will increase, um, your skeletal muscle flow, blood flow will change. So you'll start pushing, uh, your body will start pushing blood flow to the extremity so that you can fight and run. Um, and when your body's in that kind of upregulation, then 
your mind starts to upregulate as well. That's when your mind starts to get busy um, and you get a lot of chatter and things aren't necessarily clear. You can become panicky, um, which creates more stress, which drops more adrenaline, which upregulates the body more. And that's that stress. It's a very simple for explanation of that stress cycle. Um, and so that can be physical. That can be through, um, you know, training and being in a game environment. Um, but that can also be mental from thinking. Like if I said to you, if I put a stressful situation in front of you now and said that, uh, you know, for example, your family had been kidnapped or something like that. The thought of that would create that stress response. You'd get that up regulation. Um, and then your mind would start to go crazy and you probably wouldn't be that rational, which would create more stress, up regulate the physiology more. Um, and that, you know, in an extreme example of that, it's probably in, you know, heading towards anxiety or a panic attack. Um, but un- once you understand that cycle, you can understand where you need to intercept it. And the only way that you can intercept it is through breath. Uh, and so, uh, right at the very beginning, if you, when you breathe, instead of taking in and taking a short, shallow, fast breath, you know, like if I gave you a fright right now, you're going to, you know, you suck in through your mouth straight away because the body's natural um, response is to get oxygen so that you can fight and run, mm. do whatever it's setting the system to be in a, um, in a fight or flight state. Um, but if you can control your breathing right at the beginning of that by going to light, slow, deep breathing mm. um, and really slowing down and softening your breath, then you have the you can have the opposite of that entire cycle, um, which is where you can stimulate your vagus nerve through light, slow, deep breathing, um, which releases acetylcholine, which is your um, the hormone which is uh, a relaxant. So uh, when acetylcholine is released, it slows the heart rate, and when the heart rate is slowed, it makes the brain interpret that the body's safe and puts you into that more into that rest and digest state. So essentially, what we're trying to do is uh, control those two cycles. You're either in one, you're in either in the up regulation cycle, or you're putting yourself into a down regulation cycle. And so, um, in in a match, um, you know, if you've been running around, the pressure's on. Uh, you will be into an up regulated state a lot of the time, uh, and you need to be into an up regulated state because an up regulated state is good a lot of you know sometimes, but you just don't want to stay there necessarily, or you want to have control of when you are there and when you're coming back to a more relaxed state. Um, and so an example of it in real time would be if you've just hit phase after phase after phase, um, maybe it's been up and down the field uh, and you're really blowing and the whistle goes, um, the first thing to do would be to breathe, take a big breath in through your nose, slow big inhale through your nose. And your natural thing is that you're going to want to breathe through your mouth straight away. But if you're trained nasal breathing, you've got good breathing capacity, good breathing mechanics. Um, and if your biochemistry has been improved through doing the, the nasal breathing over time and the different protocols, then, you know, breathing in through your nose, taking a breath in through your nose, and then probably the, for the first couple of breaths, dumping all the oxygen out through your mouth as quickly as you can. So if you've been in a really fast passage of play time and time again, you've probably got a high level of um, carbon dioxide. And so you'll be wanting, you'll be, you'll have like an air hunger where you really need to breathe. So the first thing that you want to do so that you can slow and calm your breathing down is to dump that CO2 out of your system. The best way to do that is to take a big breath in through your nose and then just really like, <sighs> push it out through your mouth, slow inhale through your nose, really push it out, elongate it and push it out through your mouth. And by doing that in two or three of those breaths, you will um, reduce your level of carbon dioxide pretty quickly. And that should enable you to drop back into a slower, lighter nasal breath. Breath. Um, so yeah, if you were going from passage of play to passage of play, then the whistle went, the first thing, breathe in through the nose, dump it out through the mouth, in through the nose, dump it out through the mouth. And then try and find a really calm, gentle rhythm after that of nasal breathing where you're slowing down your inhale and really elongating your exhale and just trying to slow and bring your system right back down. And you should, you know, particularly with breathwork training, um, you should be able to achieve that pretty quickly. Mate, I'm coming out of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> and and the, key, the key is obviously to train it, right? Like... Um, yeah. The key is not to get into a game and try and do it. The key is that you're going into preseason or whatever now, or, or just in general when you're in the gym or you're out for a run, is to try and put yourself in that state where you've got extreme air hunger and you're, you're really blowing, mm. um, and then see how well you can control your breath straight away. Mm. Um, and it'll probably be pretty ineffective initially, but um, as you start to train it, um, you know your capacity and your ability to do that will increase. Yeah, obviously when you um, when you've got time in a game to recover. Um, you've got that chance to slow it all down. But what about when you're actually working? Like, 
um, you're in like a bronco test or something. How, how, how are you supposed to breathe in those sort of things where it's like there's no rest for you to try and downregulate your breath? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, again, like you, you should be able to con- like if you've built up your tolerance and your capacity and your mechanics, you should be able to for at least a decent percentage of that control yourself through nasal breathing. Um, but the reality is like when you're at, if you're at a hundred percent output or a really high output, then there's going to be a need at some point where you can switch over to mouth breathing. Um, the, when it comes to something like a Bronco, um, it's probably about the pre the training that you've done previously. And also, you know, there's lots of stuff. There's, there's so many different techniques and ways that you can manipulate your breath. Um, even in terms of warm ups and things like that. So things that you can do from a warm up perspective using breath holds, um, to kind of get your body to adapt to that higher level of CO2, um, and, you know, increase its efficiency. So there's certain breath hold drills that you can do, uh, in a warm up before a Bronco, which might help throughout the Bronco. Um, but I think the main thing is, is training your mental ability to stay calm and relaxed in your breath when you're under stress. I think that's, that's the bottom line. The reality is like where it's breathing is such an automatic thing. Um, and the brain sends signals to tell you when you need to breathe and we've only ever paid attention to those. So it's quite unnatural to start overriding that and pushing against some of that, um, and fighting some ear hunger and things like that. Mm. But the reality is, um, you know, the, the more that you can stay nasal breathing and to a light, slow, deep, proper mechanics um, under stress, then, you know, the better your overall performance is going to be, the calmer you're going to be in the moment. So the trick really is is just to try and master that and build up that capacity over time. Um, you know, you take Israel Adesanya, for example, uh, you know, most combat sports athletes are breathing out their mouth <laughs> within a couple of minutes. Um, and... That's just purely because they haven't really they paid a lot of attention to their cardiovascular training, not necessarily a lot of attention to their breathing training. Um, whereas Israel has been working with Dave, obviously, for uh, 18, 24 months now. Um, and, you know, for most of Israel's last two or three, four fights, he's barely taken a breath through the mouth in an entire five minute round, five, five round fight, five minute rounds. Um, you know, his nasal breath his entire way through in his rest periods and when he's standing and striking with someone. Um, and, you know, that gives him the ability to be incredibly calm and focused and present in the moment because he's not, um, you know, breathing erratically and he's, he's uh, downregulating, essentially downregulating his system and enabling himself to stay calm and creative um, despite being in a combat situation. So, you know, he's a good example of it. Um, you know, there might be times within those fights where there's huge exchanges and, you know, potentially you have to go to mouth breathing before you can switch back to nasal breathing. I think he's been pretty consistent through his nose, just about, you know, every breath of every round of every fight recently. Um, but you know, that's a good example because he's under extreme pressure, uh, and he's probably physically pretty exhausted in there as well, but he's trained himself mentally to be able to stay, um, you know, to good breathing mechanics and um, to be able to stay calm in the moment. Mm, that's a really cool example because I remember doing some boxing sessions, you know, in like the pre-seasons when you have to go 60 seconds on with body punches and stuff and those used to wreck me. Obviously, when I was boxing, I was never breathing. I was pretty much holding my breath when I was punching and then I was gasping for air um, through my mouth when I wasn't and I was always wrecked after um, a boxing session compare it to a running one where I was probably more naturally better at breathing for some reason but yeah. I felt like I could run for a long time without being as tired as if I went for one minute of um, boxing pretty much because probably my breathing was so erratic yeah totally well when you're boxing as well you're using a lot of your chest muscles so you're yeah. probably double draining those muscles like if you're breathing with your chest muscles uh, and then boxing with your your chest muscles and your upper shoulders and things you're probably mm. you know using a fair amount of energy to that part of the body um but yeah totally I, I remember when i had my first boxing fight and the coach talked about the adrenaline dump that you get um where you know we'd, we were fit as anything we'd done all these camps and you're running stupid amounts of k's and boxing stupid amounts of rounds and you get through it fine at training and you go home and you can do it all again uh, yeah. and then you step in the ring and 30 seconds in people are can't hold their hands up anymore (laughs) yeah um but you know understanding it now it's that stress response cycle it's that fear um the the build-up of the event and the event itself and then stepping in the ring and fighting someone in front of all these people when you're not used to it uh and you're you're activating that stress response in a big way and getting that 
big adrenaline dump and then your body's up regulating and, and you're just carrying that through. So um, your athletic performance isn't great in that moment. And funny looking back on it now, like if you could just remain calm by taking conscious control of your breath and really slowing your breathing down pre-fight and really taking, not saying that's easy, but really taking conscious control and not let that stress response cycle kick in into overdrive. Um, try and balance and you know keep that sympathetic uh, that balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, you know then you'd probably hop in and put well, you would hop in and perform a hell of a lot better physically yeah and you see that with the um, fight for life's a good example of that you hear about these guys um, training really hard getting in really hey, good shape for a, I think it's what two minute rounds of boxing and, and straight away they're always knackered eh? like yeah. gone off their feet yeah. So it's obviously a bit good example of it. Yeah, it's super fit guys, like obviously. So yeah. it all comes down yeah. to regulating that and controlling that that response to stress in real time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you were a young um, young athlete, again, take you take you back um, sort of fifteen years when you were an incredibly good <laughs> rugby player, incredibly good halfback, and uh, opening the nineteen combo batsman, um, <laughs> what would you be doing differently now with with the knowledge that you know? Uh, I think I'd just pay. I mean, obviously, I just pay so much more attention to my breath, but just my state in general. I'd be far more intentional about everything that I did. Um, and the, yeah, like, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but understanding that your ability to remain calm under pressure and be creative really does come down to your ability to control your physiology. Uh, and so, you know, I would never have at 15 or 16 probably paid any attention to breath at all, even if someone yeah. had told me. Yeah. Um, and I think. You know, you used to go out and you'd, you know, like you'd run and you'd try and get yourself in as best shape as you possibly could. Um, and well, actually, I didn't do much of that <laughs> when I was a teenager, but <laughs> you were in incredibly good shape. Um, but you know, you, you do all the basics well and, um, you never pay any attention to your breathing at all. And so, uh, if I could go back, uh, I would pay way more attention to it and I'd become incredibly efficient with breathing, um, uh, because it's going to help with my overall physical, um you know ability as an athlete but it's also going to mean that i'm one of those people who has control mentally Uh, and the reality is if you can have control mentally be someone who's always calm and makes the right decisions at the right times uh, then you're going to go a hell of a lot further right Mm. and i do i do think like why why are not more people doing this like why is it not in every day every team why is not everyone got like a breath coach etc but and just your point about being young, probably not listening to it, but I even do remember like at the Hurricanes, we, we did have some breathing sessions and pre-seasons, but um, I felt like we sort of just took the piss out of it because we didn't really understand yeah. what it was doing. It felt like it was um, so sort of weird to be, how how could this make a difference? Like totally. um, we should, we, We're sort of wasting time here. We should be in the gym or doing running. Like while yeah. we're block, blocking one nostril trying to breathe for <laughs> like 10 minutes in the, in the gym, it's like just felt weird. And we, I don't felt like we ever sold sold the picture or um, really understood what why we were doing it. Yeah. And well, you know what a rugby culture is like. People are pretty quick um, to take the piss out of things. And I was probably um, one of the worst. I think, I think you're exactly right. Like, I, you know, there's an explosion in breathwork um, and performance breathing at the moment. Um, you see guys like LeBron James, um, he's a big advocate of it. And, you know, when you see guys like LeBron sitting um, one minute to go in the fourth quarter in a timeout and instead of being in the team huddle, he's calming himself and, and light, light, slow, deep breathing and really um, just going into almost like a meditative state so that he can go out and be sharp in that next minute and make the right plays. Uh, you know, when you've got guys like that who are at the top of the game, Israel Adesanya, you know, best combat athlete on the planet, arguably, um, people like that, the kind of proof's in the pudding. And I think there's an explosion of it now, but it hasn't been accepted. And I think the reason it hasn't been accepted um, for a large part is purely because it is very simple, but it's been like when you think of breathwork, traditionally, you think of a hippie sitting on a rock meditating and <laughs> and breathing and not doing much. You know, it hasn't really been associated with performance. Um, and so I think uh, that's shifted massively and it will continue to shift in the coming years. Um, but I think you hit the nail on the head. Like if you're just told to breathe without an explanation of what's actually going on, then uh, you don't know why you're doing it. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, you go to the gym and you train hard in the gym because you know why and you followed certain plays because you know the outcomes that you're trying to achieve and um, understanding why and understanding the reason that you're doing something is incredibly important so the communication of it from coach to 
player um, and uh, to individual athlete is, you know, that's where it's at. And I think understanding there's so much that you can do with the breath as well. Like obviously it could be athletic performance, it could be mental performance. Um, it can be general life and um, dealing with anxiety and uh, mental health. Um, it could be for health, but there's so many different ways that you can manipulate the breath um, to get different outcomes. And I think the thing that's really important is understanding the goals really clearly of the team or the individual player so that you can start with something and have a focus um, and, and pick mental performance or pick athletic performance or pick recovery maybe initially um, and really focus on some simple frameworks around recovery even. Uh, and then through that, you get into the practice of breathwork, you start to see some of the benefits and then you can expand on it. Um, but I think if you go in and try and do 50 different things at once um, without any real understanding, then it's probably going to get lost. So, yeah, I think whoever's delivering the breathwork training, it's really important that you understand the environment, that you understand the coach, that you understand, I guess, the hierarchy of needs. And because, um, you know, these guys are already busy. Uh, you know, you go into a professional environment, you've already got training after training after training. You've got all sorts of video analysis. You've got stuff on. It's not like you want to add a whole bunch of stuff to the schedule. So, um, you can't go in and override. It's about understanding what the team's trying to achieve and where you can add breathwork to things that are already in your existing protocols. I think that's a good way to do it. Um, and then with the individual guys, um, what are they personally really trying to achieve within it? Uh, and if you can get on a level with them and really connect and understand the player, um, some maybe some of the things that they're trying to improve or things that are holding them back, then you can set specific protocols around one or two things and then work from there. Mm. And I know you're doing a little bit of work with a couple of what lad guests um ricky riccatelli uh, anton segner hugh renton uh, to name a few like what what are these guys sort of getting through at the moment like where, where are you seeing the biggest fault in rugby players um yeah so like anton's come up for a, he's done a session him and hugh come up i've done a few with hugh um and ricky as well um and obviously like you said going into a pre-season block at the moment um but again it's, it's different for every individual like um you know, uh, I won't go and talk about what those guys individually are trying to achieve necessarily, but uh, first and foremost, it's an understanding thing and, and yeah, like opening their eyes to it and, you know, holy shit, and getting the buy-in. I think that's the first thing. Um, and then, you know, looking at instances where as soon as you explain it, they can see instances in their own game or in their own life where they're inefficient mm. um, and their own weaknesses and potentially how breathing is playing into that. And so... Um, you know, these guys are hungry professionals that want to get better and they want to reach the top level. So, um, you know, they're pretty quick to admit where they're trying to improve and, and point things out to you. And then it's just about making a plan together on that. Um, it always starts with the basic stuff. I think for any athlete, you're under so much pressure. You have so much training load and then you've got life stress coming at you as well. So the biggest problem for athletes is that they're in a really sympathetic stress state a lot of the time. And for your entire career, you've been pushed up the top of a mountain. Um, you've had people, trainers, coaches pushing you, hard workers, how you make it as an athlete. You've got to outwork the competition. There's all these narratives and biases in sport where it's all about hard work and working yourself to the ground. And don't get me wrong, all of that stuff does attribute to being a great athlete and, and a successful team. But no one's ever told these guys how to come down off the mountain. Um, no one's ever taught them to relax um, and like I say being in a stress sympathetic state is not necessarily a bad thing but if you don't know how to get out of it if you don't know how to switch it off if you don't know how to balance that and come back to a parasympathetic then it would become a very problematic thing very quickly um, obviously you know little injuries creeping up on you health things creeping up on you mental health creeping up on you um, if you're in a stressed overdrive stress sympathetic state a lot of the time throughout the day and you don't know how to bring yourself down then probably your, your sleep is going to be impacted by that if you've got poor breathing mechanics and you're breathing badly during your sleep um, then your sleep's going to be affected anyway but um, if you're in a stress state during the day you're probably not going to sleep very well which obviously is not going to help with your recovery uh, probably not going to make you the sharpest the next day in terms of your training and your athletic output anyway so there's there's cycles that athletes are stuck in and a lot of the time the answer is to try and work harder to get out of it and, um, you know, it's probably about being a bit smarter in those moments and understanding that balancing the nervous system, down-regulating, um, and, you know, looking after yourself physically and mentally through breath is a great tool. Um, and it's a great way to probably, you know, avoid things like silly little injuries and, and burnout uh, and, you know, to make sure that you're mentally in a good place because I know that there's a lot of pressure as well. And, mm. um, you know, guys are... Guys are under the pump publicly and 
you have a bad game and you're rung out, you know, you, it's not just in front of a couple of people. It's in front of hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Um, social media is pretty tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's all these stresses that are thrown at professional athletes. I don't think people pay enough attention to it. We're starting to pay attention to mental health and sport now um, a bit more, but <laughs> probably not enough. Uh, and the reality is, yeah, I think the first step with a lot of athletes is simply to focus on recovery and focus on bringing them back to a, giving them a tool so that they can relax and unwind and balance the nervous system and find a nice, calm, relaxed state for even 20 minutes a day um, so that they can get a good sleep, so that they can start to recover. And obviously that's good for your mental health, good for your physical health, good for everything else. That's step one. Um, and then step two is looking at some of the performance enhancing stuff around um, your athletic ability um, and and then obviously the performance under pressure as well. Mm. Mate, you are an absolute wizard. Could talk, could talk to you about breath work for, I feel like this could be a whole series. There's, there's so much stuff that we could get through, but I haven't gone to the Instagram for questions like I usually do. I felt like we probably don't need to hear your bender stories, but <laughs> there is one question that I, I do want to finish with that I finish with every episode, and it is uh, what's, what would be the best advice you have for a Waterlad listener? Mate, that's a hell of a question. One piece of advice. I think it would be that your your internal state is really all you have. Like, um, when it comes down to it, yeah, you can chase, you know, accomplishments and money and, and whatever else. Um, you can pride yourself on being the hardest worker. There's, there's all these things that we do uh, in life. But I think the reality is, like, in life, really all you actually have to carry with you uh, is your internal state. And so prioritizing and paying attention to how you feel and doing things to create a blissful state and a state where you're genuinely happy, um, you know, where you're, where you're at peace um, is a worthwhile investment of your time. Um, and I think previously, probably in my own life, I've probably pushed, I've always been really outcome driven and goal driven. Um, and I've, like I say, you know, mentally tried to build myself into someone who's bulletproof and thrive in adversity and all this type of stuff. But I don't know if I enjoyed the journey as much back then. And um, I think having found more balance through breath work uh, and learned to downregulate myself and create like a really nice flow state and be able to control my mindset a bit better, my psychology and a bit better, um, not experience that underlying anxiety and things like that, I think looking back I would just say that it's really really important to pay attention to your internal state and how you can better it because that's the one thing that's with you for your whole life mate oh, <laughs> the best piece of advice yeah like I've had um, I don't know how many guests probably 160 or but that was a unique piece of advice I've never heard that before internal state that was special and and so true like um you're right like everyone's in this goal to chase things for different reasons and social media posts and stuff like that but it really comes down to how you, how you feel. feel yeah 100 how you feel how happy you are at the end of the day there's multi-millionaires who commit suicide there's professional athletes who commit suicide mm. um there's people who battle throughout their whole lives who have everything on the outside but don't have their internal state and then there's people who have their internal state and are genuinely peaceful and happy who don't have much else um who have a really good quality of life and um i think if you can be really ambitious and, and driven and chase your dreams and do all your stuff whilst maintaining that inner peace then you're winning right so. right love it what a way to finish one of the greatest podcasts yeah um, i knew i needed to get you on to um, go through this and even even that like i feel like i'm gonna have to listen to that sort of three times to comprehend some of those big words you said but um i, I just i hope the people listening can feel like this breath work can uh, potentially give themselves some benefits for whether they're professional rugby players or any sort of workforce like I know lawyers and things like that yeah. huge jobs with huge amount of stress which um, this breath, breath work can be so beneficial for them eh? that's right and yeah I mean I've got clients who are lawyers for example and it's the same yeah. thing right they're extremely high performance people they need to be sharp they need to be on when they when they're on um, but the flow on effect of being constantly on over a 10 year period is a real big decline in mental health, physical health, mm. um, you know, not so good habits, potentially, um, struggle with sleep and things like that. Uh, and so, you know, by just coming back and, and focusing on that internal state and, um, down regulating and learning to bring yourself back, you can be more effective in your work, uh, and have a better quality of life. And yeah, it's not just for athletes, mate, it's for anyone. Um, mm. Like my life's drastically improved on the back of it, and um, I think that's why I'm so passionate about it. it. 
you know, I love the sports performance aspect of it. Um, I love the performance under pressure stuff, but I think the biggest thing is uh, just a better quality of life. So appreciate you having me on, mate, and I could probably sit here and talk to you for another couple. Just feel like we just got, I just got cranking and just got into it. Just like, started. <laughs> yeah, I have to get you back I'm on. Gonna, I'm going to have to listen to it and hear what I just said. But um, <laughs> no, I do appreciate it, mate. And I know, um, yeah, I always appreciate, you know, having those chats with you. And uh, I think, you know, you going into a coaching role and stuff like that, your interest in these types of things, uh, you know, will be extremely beneficial uh, to the players and things like that. So thank you for embracing it and uh, having a conversation about it. No worries, mate. I'll, I'll be breathing through my nasals up in the coach's box, staying very calm. Right, I'll be on you. Next. I'll be on you. <laughs> <laughs> but also super grateful for everything you've done. You've been a massive um, help to get this podcast up and running. I know you run your own very successful podcast and what you've taught me throughout this process has been um, priceless. So um, there's no no doubt that you've helped Waterlad get to where it is uh, today. So I um, really appreciate all the insights you've given me along the journey and um, managed to pass on some of the things that you learnt from on your mistakes, which hopefully I can pass on to anyone else who's um, also in this game. But, um, yeah, really appreciate what you've done for me and um, thanks for coming on. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. And, yeah, keep going with the potty, mate. It's awesome to see. I actually had to dust my mic off before I hopped on just to <laughs> get the camera back out. But you've inspired me to get rolling again, mate. It's been great to have a chat. Mate, get the potty back going, as I say. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe next year. <laughs> All right, brother. Cheers, mate.